Well, good morning, everybody. Today's October the 16th. This is Marijuana and THC in 2023. Our session today will be Dr. Letitia Bader talking about women and weed. It's going to be a great session. You'll enjoy this. Highly entertaining and very, very educational. Our next of this five-part series will be on November 20th with Understanding 21st Century Marijuana with Mr. Ben Court. If you haven't seen Ben, you've got to catch his act. And our final session for the year will be December 15th, The Truth About Today's Marijuana, Johnny Sack's Life and Death Story with his mom, Laura Stack. Brought to you today by Minnesota Regional Pretensions, ATOD coordinators. Thank you, Kyla, for being such a great partner in crime and the National Marijuana Initiative from the Haida Program. Just a few reminders, if you would mute your mics, turn your cameras off. If you've got a question, type it into the chat function, address to everybody, and we'll get to Q&A at the end of the session. If you're looking for good information on good research findings, not hype, not misinformation, but good facts, go to our website, the NMI. This is Marijuana in 2023, Women and Weed with Dr. Letitia Bader. I'm Dale Quigley. My partner in crime is Ed Shamalia, and we are the National Marijuana Initiative. We'll be getting started here in just one moment. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a great day. Happy Monday. You survived the weekend. It is an honor for me to introduce to you probably one of the smartest people I know and one of the nicest people I know, Dr. Letitia Bader. Dr. Bader has got a remarkable talent for public speaking and her grasp of knowledge and just really a, a nice person to be a wickedly smart. So I'm not going to give you a big build up, Letitia. I don't want to take your CV away from you, but I want the folks to hear you. So with that, I'm going to mute down, turn this over to you. And ladies and gentlemen, enjoy Letitia Bader. Thank you so much. I love it when people actually don't introduce me. So I met these two fantastic gentlemen um, because of exactly what I'm about to do for y'all. I just started talking um, about cannabis. And when we talk about cannabis, really, I'm going to start, you're already going to start to hear me talk as a scientist, as a treatment provider. And that's actually who I am. I'm a licensed psychologist. I'm a licensed addictions counselor, and I'm actually a certified mental performance consultant. I know that that means nothing to outside of the world of sport, but that's actually how I got started. I'm a sports psychologist, and I was training and being around some of the best of the best, um, some of the most elite people that I ever had the pleasure of being around. And what I wanted um, to really know, what I wanted to really know is how do they make their peak performance every day. And so that's what we're going to do today. I started talking about cannabis and its impact because I was in Colorado when they industrialized cannabis. And y'all, I'm going to start to use words like that. I hope that you're going to be all right with them. You're going to hear them because I want my chance to educate you um, to kind of change the hearts and minds of your perception as well. And so I made it to Colorado and I really, again, not resentful of any substance in particular. Um, I'd been in the treatment field for a long time. I've been here, I've been around for almost 20 years in the treatment field. Um, I've worked in corrections. I've worked in Native American health, um, athletic departments, national sport leagues, um, and then in frontline treatment. And that's where I stayed. So here we are. Let's do it. Because what happens is I want to get... Um, First of all, I want to welcome you all. If I if we didn't welcome you, I would love to do this as we, uh, I usually kind of walk around the tables and get to know the people that I'm around, but I want to welcome you all as female. Um, you're here because the topic is very clear, right? Women and weed. And I'm so glad that you logged on because that's usually when I lose people is when we start to talk about um, a substance. And if we do it in a gender specific way, sometimes half of the chromosomes, right? will walk out of the room. So thank you. Because what I love to do and learn is that if we take a topic, right, that we think we know pretty well, and we kind of flip it on its head, we actually learn more. So I do want to welcome you into this place. And I want to welcome you to say that substances are gender inclusive. And I hope I already get an amen from that. Everyone, y'all, welcome to the table. You can use as much substances at any age and any gender and any type of fluidity that you would imagine but substances are not gender neutral. So I'm gonna welcome you all because we all began as female, if you didn't know that. Females actually dominate the population, but until the 90s, we actually didn't even, uh, we weren't even studied. And so to think about that is that that limited amount, I think some of us have jeans or t-shirts that are probably um, earlier than the night. We know 
our, our music sample uh, from the 80s, if you think about it that way. So we are fresh. Uh, we are a fresh research population for that. And it's a small amount of research. So you're going to already see that we're going to do a little bit of story and a lot of bit of science whenever we have the science. So everybody welcome. Settle in. Um, we're going to educate, educate and entertain is always my guess um, is what I'd love to do. So I got to let you know is that women are coming to the cannabis field, like we're coming to the industry in droves. So the new users that are coming to the market today um, in, the, in the age that we have now, not at the very beginning, but right now, women are coming to the cannabis market and we are using. And I'm going to tell you what we're using and how we're using. Um, so according to the Brightfield Group, you see we are on the forefront. So we are the ones walking into the dispensaries. We're the ones walking in, even still in the black market um, that are kind of buying up product. Uh, as we speak. So I do have to walk you back in time. The way that it goes when you roll out any substance, any new substance, in order to get people to use it, women are actually the marketing. We are not marketed to, we are the marketing. And so that's actually how it started with cannabis. Y'all, these showed up at my house. Um, I just want to let y'all know that. And it really was a really quick understanding that I probably wasn't the one that they were marketing to. So between Fred Flintstone, Buxom co-eds, right? And who wouldn't hit this? I probably wasn't that first generation that they were marketing to. Insert 2017. And y'all, this is not that long ago. As you can start to see, if you're if you're listening, you can listen. I'll try to describe. But if you have a visual um, of the slides, go ahead and take a look at her. She is a fantastic co-ed. But again, if y'all can look at her and compare me, um, I'm not her. So I knew um, that cannabis probably still wasn't for me, but we were already entering the market at that time. So my deep dive goes like this. I, I love the headline because I was like, huh, maybe weed is made for me. Maybe it's for women. And that is when I started started to do um, a deep dive on some of the gender differences that we're going to start to see. So you don't have to do this a Google search. Trust me, you don't want any of this history on your computer. But just remember when cannabis first came out and when we started then marketing to women, not using women, but when they were bringing this marketing message straight home to women is that it was going to do a plethora of things. It actually topped out at doing on treating more than 30 ailments um, when it came to it. And y'all, those little pictures on the side, they're um, just fun little like pop shots, right? The Women's Guide like is actually um, a book that was sold on Amazon. And the women who lead, um, although they took the title um, of the um, presentation, I had it first in that way. But y'all, that's amazing. It's a slick magazine that I found at Walgreens um, when I was traveling in the middle of the country. That one's actually at Oklahoma when I found that one. But y'all, we have magazines now that are influencing our lives. We have books that tell us how to make hemp soap and vaginal inserts, right? Like vaginal suppositories. And we are going to say extra places on our body um, because we do have extra places, y'all, for substance and we use it and we put it there. So it was going to relieve everything. It was going to help with mental health. It was going to help with weight maintenance. It was going to help our sleep. It was going to help with pregnancy, cancer, aging. And it was going to alleviate many, many concerns and help us just enjoy life more. And that is where the marketing started to come. One of the first marketing messages that went straight to women too, remember we have gender differences. So we did start to learn that this, that substance like cannabis is going to affect us differently as we put it into our bodies. And so that's one of the things that I already want you to take note. There's going to be a couple things when we talk about cannabis. Um, I, I tried to make it a cool, like all P acronyms, but I don't. I want I want you to listen for the following things. I want you to make sure that you understand about potency before we leave our time together here. I also want you to learn about the products. I want you to really understand the perception of risk. And then I want you to pay a keen ear to pregnancy. So there's a certain part in our time certain part of our life, right, is that we are really going to make sure that where substances fit and don't fit into our world. And then we're going to talk a lot about treatment. But you can already start to see that the gender differences were being marketed and being researched differently for men to women. And that is some of the very first marketing that came out. They were going to have strains for women, for sex, for our pleasure, um, how we would use it during all kinds of times in our life. 
almost once a month, right? So it got marketed for PMS relief, PMDD, right? Postmenopausal, perimenopausal, anything that had to do uh, with our uterus or the cycle of our uterus at the time, um, cannabis was going to help alleviate and treat those things. But y'all, when we talk about pregnancy, we're going to talk about the marketing here, and then we're going to talk about the science a little bit later. I just got to let you know that that is really one of the keen ways that the industry has, uh, uh, I don't even know, like droves of money have been invested into marketing cannabis for pregnancy. Now, cannabis does work for nausea. That's I'm never going to be that woman that doesn't tell you that cannabis works for some things because it's a drug. Drugs work. And we know that, right? They sedate us. They manufacture things. They provide euphoric recall or they provide euphoria. Um, and so it's one of those things that we're going to really talk about. Drugs work um, and when and how they work, but the risks that come with it. So cannabis was brought um, into the market and it was going to help with parenting and pregnancy. And if y'all haven't heard this, there's really a movement called Canna Parenting and you can kind of Google it. You can see that when mommy gets high, that's actually a book. It's a children's book that explains why and when uh, mom or dad might use cannabis in a way to help them be a better parent. But we were getting a lot of reports um, and then a study followed, right? That dispensaries were recommending and suggesting that cannabis be used in that first trimester, the one uh, first into second trimester, the one that we have the most difficulties with morning sickness and nausea. And so we started to use, women really started to increase their use from that um, daily use, right? We were getting maybe 1% of people that would report daily use up to three, and those numbers are old. Um, and we're continuing to track these numbers, but that's what we're starting to see. And when we were... Um, kind of surveying the dispensaries that were open at the time, they were 83% of them, as you can see, were giving recommendations um, that cannabis was a really um, a good, great way to treat nausea, especially in early pregnancy. It was also proposed to us that cannabis was going to help mental health. And that's what we say for women, right? It was going to help with anxiety and stress and depression, parenting again, insomnia, anything um, that was coming up for us that, especially for women, right? When we think about that especially right in the middle of the pandemic where we had stress, cannabis was going to be the way to help us out. So I grabbed um, a little excerpt from one of the women in weed magazines that I picked up and it said, y'all, and this is what we hear in our intake, right? And y'all have heard this, especially if you're in the treatment field. Sometimes the very first time that I use substances is when I actually feel normal, right? Because I'm turning parts of my brain off. I say it when I'm in treatment, when I'm in the rooms, um, I say drugs work because they often turn your give a damn off, right? They turn that part of your brain that's really loud and kind of rattling around is it sedates that brain, it numbs that part of the brain. And cannabis is no different. We're actually gonna talk about how it's impacting our emotional health as well. But that's what we heard. The marketing was the very first time weed showed me it was possible to turn off that nagging voice. And y'all, again, this is messages from the industry, not from the treatment providers. But y'all, I have to see that, right? Like in a year, in two years, she classed up. So if you look um, at the co-ed that um, was on there first, you can tell that she's aged with grace and beauty. Um, skin looks great. Hair looks great. No real impact from substance use. And then she is classed up. I'm just going to throw a little um, vintage marketing on there. It looks familiar. It's because it is. And so we are really telling women in particular, right, women of all ages and class and status that this is going to be the way, um, kind of be the drug that we put in our purse, it's the drug that comes with us in our families. But we also, auto, uh, marketing for cannabis also offered a lot of entrepreneurship. It offered a lot of inclusion. And so this is the cannabis woman of today. This is the industry in the marketing that says, come here, you can start your own farm. You can be at the top of the business game. Um, I actually read the book as Breaking the Grass Ceiling. And it was those promises that this industry was going to be lucrative uh, for women in particular, and that of even the BIPOC community, right? Is everyone of any age and any ethnicity was welcome into this industry, um, there was a place for you. Even celebrities jumped on board, right, to let us know exactly how they were using these products and how it was going to help us age um, for our mental health and our longevity. And you can start to see this message really change. So that was marketing, right? And trust me, 
the products got into our home and they came and y'all, the products that we're about to show and the placement of it, and I say that, products are one thing, but placement is another, is that you will start to see that these products go from morning until night, from our bathrooms to our kitchens. And that to me is very different than some other substances. So if I have your attention again, think about that. Alcohol doesn't necessarily have a place in your bathtub, right? Heroin doesn't have a place um, as, a, as a scented candle in your world. We don't often walk around, right, like seeing crack t-shirts. Um, if we think about that, and I hope I get a little couple giggles as we go through, but if you think about that changes our hearts and our minds when we can decorate with a product, when we can wear a t-shirt, when we almost become an influencer for this product, right? for this substance. So take a look for me um, and you can start to see all the types of cannabis that we can produce now. We're going to talk a little bit about products and potency again. So now we started with plant, right? And we knew that, um, but we now can have concentrates, distillates, tinctures, edibles, topicals. If I'm already saying words that you don't know, this is your chance to have a deep dive and go ahead and pass the pop quiz that we're going to do at the beginning, at the end, right? We say that. I want you to start to understand potency. And that changed because of the products that we figured out how to produce from this original plant, going all the way from 0% THC up to 99.9% .9 THC. And I'm going to start to show you how that um, potency starts to insert itself. So that's my first P word, right? When we talk about it, right? So please, please come back for the understanding of potency. If this is already Cannabis 101 for you, let's just give it a good review. So a long time ago in a land far away, right? We understood that there was a Chinese emperor. If y'all didn't know that, that's actually who, uh, how we found the very first plant product of cannabis. It was in a Chinese emperor's tomb, 2900 BC. I want you to remember your first number. It's 0 0.03. That is the amount of THC, the stuff that gets you high. Remember THC, part of the plant, CBD. The original plant was like a one to one ratio. The part that got you high, right? The CBD was hopefully the intention of the original plant is the part that kind of kept the lid on. That's where we're going to actually find some of the medicine. Y'all, we've already found the medicine and we've already turned it into medication. Um, but let's go back to potency. Chinese emperor, we got our first numbers, right? 0.03% THC. We kept being better gardeners over the years, over the millennials, right? Like, so we brought this product into the now and we brought this plant into the current understanding that we have now. The next number I want you to remember is 0.3% THC. So make sure you put the decimal, it's very important. That's what we all, especially in the United States, we're all going to agree that that is now an agricultural product and that's going to be hemp. And so that's all of us kind of agree, like that's kale, right? That's lettuce. It's something that we might consume, right? It would be in our food products. We could use it. And th that's what we do with hemp, right? We made rope out of it. We won a war with it. Y'all, there's some t-shirts made out of it. We put it in food products. We put it in lotion. That's hemp. It has 0.3% THC. So even that little tiny bit of a mind mood altering substance shows up in what we would consider an agricultural product. If I'm talking numbers that don't make sense, bring you into Woodstock. So Woodstock, like changing musical knowledge, it literally changed our culture. Woodstock weed was about 4%, 4%. And as you start to follow the, your mental understanding, as well as the graph, you can start to see where the, you might enter into the cannabis story as well. We talk about research, everything, all of the science that I'm going to offer you after this is based on what we consider, right, research grade cannabis. That's going to be 12% THC, 12 to 16. Internationally, when we, this is like globally, y'all, when we talk globally, when we say high potency THC, that's anything above 10% THC. So you already know that I am in numbers well above that. And you can start to see exactly, and y'all, you know, these numbers come from Colorado and you're going to see some irony to it. But as soon as we industrialize cannabis, we can get plant-based products right now up to 45% THC. 
we didn't stop there. So don't let me think that that if, if somebody already like fell out of their chair, trust me, it keeps going. But I want you to see the for profit we talk about substances. As soon as an industry enters into making a substance, we are going to see some intensity of the drug uh, grow significantly. So throw that number in your mind. We can now get potencies plant-wise up to kind of 45%. And y'all, we made it. Indica, sativas, hybrids, all of the plant that you would love for it to go. You can go up, you can go down, you can go sideways. I do want to let you know that we even had to reclassify cannabis. If this one isn't for you, think about this. Alcohol has not changed. The flavors have changed, right? The fact that we took the stink out of the drink has changed. We've made it odorless, sometimes colorless. That's alcohol as well. But alcohol has always been and probably will be a biphasic drug. The agency, actually how alcohol works, has not changed over the years. Cannabis has. Cannabis is classified. I want you to answer this. Is it a stimulant, a depressant, a hallucinogen, or a narcotic? And y'all, it's all of them. We have had to reclassify this drug because of what we have done to it. And I'm going to say those words is synthetically, right? Chemically, what we have done to this drug. We have changed this drug and how it interacts with our bodies. So this is the cannabis of today. When we first move into concentrates, I do want to give you some more numbers. See that little kind of goopy, it's a concentrate, right? It's hanging off of, a, of an e-knife, a hot knife. If you stare at the head of a pen, right? That's what we were supposed to do. That's how we actually got the verb, not the dorky dance, right? But dabbing was supposed to be when we take the a hot e-knife, right? A needle and dip it or dab it into the concentrates and combust it, right? In front of our face, um, about 700 to 900 degrees. So if you're trying to talk about vaping, please know just because we took the fire out and we did not take the heat out, right? So we changed this solid, into a vapor, into a steam right in front of our face. And that is seven joints in one hit. And y'all, the numbers continue to go up. So I want you to think about that, that plant-based product that we kind of like, we juiced it chemically, right? Now this is an insane amount of cannabis, of THC, the stuff that gets us high, um, that we can immediately um, smoke, right? We can vape it and go about our, our merry way, but we've now ingested almost seven times, right? One joint. These can get up to 99.9% .9 potency for THC. But if you look at some of the knowledge there is, although they might look a little cleaner and um, they look a little bit different, most of these um, contain contaminants whenever we test them. Really like molds, pesticides, fungus, all of the things, because this is not a federally regulated product as of yet. Right, So we're still kind of going state by state. And although we are growing massive amounts of cannabis, um, it's not necessarily in a clean, um, hygienic way, if you put it that way. So this is the cannabis of today. This picture, if you have turned away, look at your screen now. This is the cannabis of today. This is what I deal with, I know, in treatment. I even have um, athletes, especially young people that actually have never even interacted with a plant-based product um, as we go through. Their onset, their introduction to cannabis is usually in this form, in some type of a, of a vape pen. So y'all, we're buying it up. So bring on back women, right? We are buying up plants. We are buying up concentrates, edibles, flowers, pre-rolls, tinctures. I don't have enough voice to tell you all of the products um, that are now in our dispensaries ready and able for us. But I do want to let you know how it gets into our home. Marketing tells us that it's for body and for pleasure. We literally, we can put it topically, we can insert it, we can put it on our hair, we can put it in our bath, um, lubricants, anything that you would want to do, we have it. It's for body and for pleasure. It's being marketed for beauty and aesthetics. You can see a product like Skin Dope that goes for $150. You would use that in a matter of three weeks. Our topicals, if you used it the way that they were sort of prescribed or recommended, you could go through one of those cans in about two weeks. But I want y'all to see, y'all, this was at my CVS, is if I can put a cannabis leaf on mascara, I want you to think of the perception of risk. 
it continues to decrease year and year and year. And we have studies from monitoring the future. Um, we have studies that are letting us know that people, when we ask about cannabis in particular, is, is it um, a risky drug? We are continuing to get drops and drops and drops in that perception of risk. And that to me makes a drug um, very dangerous, honestly dangerous. I'll go ahead and go for my soundbite today. Um, whenever we don't think something's risky, we're willing to use it um, at all times. And that gets, especially for women, um, that perception of risk was one of the key features that happens is that if we can decrease that perception of risk, I would be willing to use it any time um, throughout my lifetime. Y'all, we, we, we put it in the house, we put it in the bathroom, and we put it in the pantry. So between Pop-Tarts and coffee, um, the number one selling product for women is cannabis-infused beverages. And we really need to be careful with those. We're going to talk about being cross-faded or crossed, um, simultaneous use of alcohol and cannabis later on. But I just want to let you see the market um, that is still there. Candles, clothing. Um, I covered it up, if y'all can see, but like the social imaging now is that we're supposed to look like Barbie and smoke like Marley. And y'all, if we can put it on leggings and jeggings, um, we are introducing it as part of our culture. It's becoming who we are. And uh, that's hard to separate when you start to try to separate yourself from an identity um, and tough to do so with substances. And I always say that, y'all, we can accessorize it. It is very personal. Um, the same thing goes with our phone, right? But if we can get the Little Mermaid and we can bedazzle our own um, pipes, then you know that it's become, it's, 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 it's found a sacred place in our lives. Those are the products today. Tinctures with tinctures and edibles, we can literally put them anywhere undetected. Um, and they are then colorless and odorless as well, right? When we smoke them or drink them and we can put them in any products. Um, thanks for NMI for doing this study is that when we did walk into this dispensary, we were starting to see that women were favored uh, topicals and tinctures more than men, but that that stat is gonna be changing, um, I know, uh, hand, over, hand over fist in the next couple of years. So I just wanna throw a little bit of a, a side talk in here um, because I always talk about the farm bill. So the farm bill in 2018 made it okay for everybody across the nation to grow hemp. Again, not my concern at the time, but we talked about where hemp is gonna get its introduction and y'all can see that, right? Hemp is a, a very low potency THC product. It comes through, it's in our clothing and our food. But what happens, again, um, as an industry, especially if I'm making profit off of it, I'm going to take something that now we can all grow, and then I'm going to try to harvest something and then make money out of it, and then probably go ahead and turn it into a mind mood altering substance. And so CBD is being presented and marketed, especially for women, as a supplement or a nutraceutical, they would call it. And there are some benefits in, to, in CBD. Remember, it was it's cool enough. CBD is powerful enough to balance out that THC part of the plant. So we are going to see some angiolytics, some antidepressants, some anti-inflammatory in that, but again, in very small amounts. We talk a lot um, about, again, the positive products, but we talk a lot about supplements and y'all, I do this for athletes all the time. I have to tell you, as soon as we start to take a supplement instead of like eat it um, and use it through our own like eat it through nutrition um, or use it um, as it's supposed to be intended. Sorry, I'll find my words is that we often overdo it. And so we know that as we even take vitamins right now and excrete most of um, the vitamins because we often take too many. Um, but CBD is out there. I just want to throw it out there because there are some risks to it, especially if you're starting to use it as part of your medication regimen, right? If you're, it's helping with your boo-boos and your ailments, right? Or maybe you have some, um, family members that have started to add it to their regimen, please know that CBD can be sedating, has some drowsiness to it. There is liver damage and toxicity. We are having right now a lot of concerns with um, reproductive concerns. And I say that so for male reproductive toxicity, there's a 29% decrease. So 
So a 29% decrease in sperm count and motility. So if you are having a couple um, that's having trouble with fertility, I sell both couples, both male and female, um, to get off THC and CBD for at least um, three or four months when you think about it, um, because it's having significant effects. But my caveat is kind of the consumer beware, buyer be warned, is please know that there's unknown purities and potencies out there. Because again, it's not a federally regulated product. So CBD has these med-med interactions. They have drug interactions, 10 or major, um, and we have some moderate ones, but they really do get in the way of a lot of medications. People on blood thinners, um, mental health medications, they're getting in the way of it. But I just want to remind you that what's on the front of the bottle and the back of the bottle doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's in the bottle. Again, because it's not a federally regulated product yet. So we can see one of the studies that we did um, was only 31% of the CBD product that was sort of promised on the front of the bottle was actually in the bottle. Just keeping that in mind. So let's get back to THC, right? The part that gets us high and the facts on our brain and body. So I am going to give a shout out to just understanding more of the endocannabinoid system. So thanks to this industry and, and the, the like lightning speed of what we're learning of, of how it affects our brain and our body. Cause y'all, we actually didn't know what this medicine, what cannabis did, um, in, in our brains until the nineties, until the mid nineties is when they actually figured out how that THC, right. Was locking into our CB1 receptor and actually getting us high. So if you look at the screen, you're going to see where the CB1 and CB2 receptors are located, but I really want you to focus on those CB1 receptors and you'll start to see the cluster, right? Right? in our minds, our brains, and then you're starting to see that cluster kind of in our guts. But it is a tip to tail, a top to bottom experience whenever we get high, affecting our motor activity, our thinking, our coordination, appetite. Um, and so this is the concerns that we have, especially for women. We're going to talk about when it affects us and how it affects us, um, especially at certain times of our lives that are different, right? Because if y'all don't know that and you haven't ever had the pleasure of being pregnant, is a medication that's okay before pregnancy can be very detrimental and dangerous during pregnancy, even food. And this is where you're going to get a giggle. If we were all in a room together, something as benign as you would think about, right? As like deli meat is that you could eat deli meat prior to pregnancy, but they very much tell you not to eat cold, cold cuts, deli meat during pregnancy. You have to heat them up. And as a woman that had a Jimmy John's problem, y'all, if you think about that is for a certain period of time, deli meat, soft cheese, right? Shrimp, too many things um, that are raw or uncooked sushi can actually become a risk, much less different medications. During certain parts of our lives, there are times that it is very unsafe to use certain products, especially certain substances. Um, so this is what was starting to happen with women. We've seen the surge of cannabis use, and we're starting to really see that this is probably, and we know what the words illicit or, or legal or illegal, right? Um, at the time, when we talk about it for federally illicit drugs, cannabis is becoming the number one drug that we are turning to and we're using. And this is why we use we use it to fight exhaustion. And when y'all, when I'm in treatment at women's recovery, we, we have a gender specific IOP. We always break it down using kind of a native American approach to say, um, how are we feeling mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually? And we do it in that four ways. So I always talk about exhaustion or pain, that mental pain, that emotional pain, physical pain, and spiritual pain. And y'all, that is very different. And so when we're talking about the treatment of cannabis, we also talk about why we use. This is why women start to step up and use substances. Exhaustion, we're going to cope with pain. We're going to self-treat mental health problems is that we're going to use a substance before we would ever sort of go to a doctor or use um, potentially like an SSRI for that. That is really a women's way. Um, and we use it for controlling weight. And although that doesn't make sense, right? Because cannabis actually increases appetite when we use it. That's what we would normally think of as like the munchies, right? But what happens with substance use, especially for women, is that we will actually start to choose the use of substance over nutrients um, and over food. And so we will wait and stave off. We will not eat or drink other things in order to then have our substance on board. 
but I just want to bring your eyes um, to the pictures that are in front of you. Now, these companies, these t-shirts didn't exist three years ago. They didn't exist. Um, they weren't even, I believe, a thought uh, four years ago. And so things like you got to nourish to flourish, mommy needs her medicine, mommy needs to microdose. These phrases were not even in our vernacular uh, until we turned the calendar, right? Actually, right during the pandemic. And so we just want to think about that is how how substances are really brought into the family, how they're brought into women's lives, and how then they stick around. Science lets us know and research lets us know, also anecdotally, y'all know, is that women are actually very heavily influenced by their partners. And that does not have to come to us in a heteronormative way. You just need to look around at the people that are in their worlds. So if somebody around me is doing a substance, eventually I might take on those patterns, right? So if, or if they're a golfer, I might seriously think about taking up golf um, for that reason. But if you want to look at how a woman's behavior is going to change, please look at their environment. Please look at the people that are around them and start to kind of assess the behaviors that are happening within that culture as well. Women will take on those patterns. All right, this is the emotion, this is the information heavy slide. So come on back. These are the direct effects of cannabis on our mind and our bodies. So we're going to break it down just a little bit. And I'm going to highlight some of the things um, that I really want you to think about. If we go direct effect on our bodies, it is going to have, we kind of, I do it for a lot of athletes. When I talk to athletes, I talk about our substance use as like a stopwatch. So start the stopwatch. And then I use for the next at least 24 hours, we're going to have slowed neuronal activity, but we are going to have some very, although they may feel subtle, um, significant impacts on our body itself. Slowed reaction time, slowed motor coordination, perceptual accuracy, right? The things around me. Cannabis in particular very much changes our perception. We're going to have a lot of trouble with breathing, um, especially if we're taking it, if the route of administration is vaping. We're going to have trouble with oxygen intake. I'm going to talk about this heart rate increase um, because I don't have the direct numbers on there. On a, it's on a different slide. So I want to hear, I want you to hear me. Is that if I choose to vape cannabis, my heart rate, and y'all chronic users say this, it's not something about tolerance or anything, is that my heart rate is going to go up 20 to 50 beats per minute for two to three hours. And y'all can hear me slow down my voice because I just want you to think about that. If you wanted to hit your smart watch, right, and grab your heart rate right now, I would want you to think about what that would be like is that if you were suffering with anxiety and then you added 20 to 30 beats per minute on top of that heart rate and sustained it for a while, that to me can't be a drug um, that's very helpful for those of us that are struggling, right, to be in our own skin um, and to deal with some of that uh, potential like trauma and anxiety, right? Just those of us that are running in a bit more activated body, if you will. It's going to increase bronchitis. That is because we are heating up our esophagus, our entire breath pathway. And we talk a lot about hydration, especially when I get to talk to athletes. And we know that say like for alcohol, it's like a one-to-one -one ratio. Take a drink, right? We would have a drink and then we would want to drink one unit of uh, water in order to try to balance out that dehydration. We have some people right now that are working on the science for us, but they're thinking about that it might be like a one to 10 ratio when it comes to vaping of how dehydrated we actually are. Because if you think about it, right, I'm sticking, it's, it's fire and it's that heat and it's getting me from the nose, right, into the sinuses, all the way down through the esophagus, lungs, into the lungs, even into the stomach that it's dehydrating us. Um, and so that's what we're working a lot on um, bronchitis, a lot of repeated kind of, uh, it's called esophageal, right? We're he heating up our um, repeated bronchial dilation is the fancy word for it. Um, but it's a lot of dehydrating um, for us. So just thinking about that, sorry, I'm going to belabor that. Um, but we, especially I know when we get into the winter is that please know if you're having conversations about people vaping is to really talk about um, how dehydrating that is just in general, be it nicotine or cannabis for that. Um, it's going to disrupt us um, at the brain stem. So it's going to change our ability to control our temperature, uh, regulate our electrolyte imbalances, and we're going to have a lot of respiratory fatigue, um, 
a lot of respiratory, like for lungs and breathing, as well as anaerobic fatigue, essence, y'all, it just slows us down. So that's why I said, if you listen to all of that science and you are just a human being trying to have a regular performance of life, it literally slows us down. Um, and that is from that electrical impulses, right? From that bilateral kind of communication from the brain. Um, and for most of us, that would be detrimental. But if somebody that's struggling with like ADHD, if you think about like that, sometimes the brain slowing might actually be really attractive. And so we just have to kind of think about that is the substances that we're using when and how it's matching our needs. But I'm here mostly for the cannabis impact for your mind. That's how a psychologist, a sports psychologist got started talking to everyone. Y'all, it is impaired memory and judgment and it is worsening our depression. It's causing acute anxiety and paranoia. And y'all, this is not a word that I would have used about this substance. And we're going to talk about the intensity. Um, that is because directly from the potency that we've seen these increases, there are increased risks of psychosis, right? Seeing things and hearing things and believing things that are not there. That is how high potency cannabis, remember we talk about that, especially as we get into the dabbing and the concentrates is it's actually having the effect that it's called pruning. And it's what would happen when um, we would then be diagnosed with schizophrenia. So our brain prunes, right? Too much. It takes dendritic information. It takes some connections in the brain and it causes, um, and we're saying correlational now, but we're really getting to a place that we can start to say causational is that high potency cannabis is increasing the risk of psychosis almost up to eight times the amount that we've seen in the past. And y'all, that is why I'm here today. This is what I see. It's what I'm hearing from professional teams, women, men, young, old, you name it, elderly, whoever is using cannabis, especially um, within kind of concentrate forms, is that we are hearing about psychosis and it is super tough to treat. I do want to bring, and again, right, we, we don't have to go to that level in order to understand what cannabis is doing to us as a system, but I want to take your, I just want to take you down this one study, because to me, this is the impact that it's having a lot on women, families, um, and just our interactions. So as we know, when we use cannabis, it affects different parts of our brain, right? So we know that. But what it does, because it's that full body experience, especially in the brain, you know, we have CB1 receptors everywhere in the brain, is that it's going to then decrease our ability to regulate our emotions. We're kind of numb, right, in that way. It's going to slow down our ability to process emotions um, when we do it that way. Remember the slowing of the brain, that's starting to make sense. But what is really affecting me. And I think about this, the things that I have the most concern about is that it's reducing our ability to identify emotions. We kind of know that y'all it's, it's kind of how we can sit there and not give a damn for a while, right? It's dulling a lot of our perception of our feelings. I think that's how we know why it's working, right? If we're feeling nervous, anxiety, like overwhelmed, anything is that drugs really sedate our ability. Cannabis in particular kind of sedates our ability to feel. I don't think a lot of people would disagree with me, but what I do want to let you know is that we really saw it with three emotions in particular. It was an inability to identify happiness, sadness, and anger. So y'all, if we think about this feedback loop that we would have with each other, if we were parenting, if we were coaching, if we were just trying to fall in love that day, right? Is that if you and I are using, I can now not accurately identify if you're happy with me, if you're disappointed or sad with me, and if you're maybe a little frustrated. And so I think that's really getting in the way um, our, of our, our relational abilities, especially as parents and especially like as treatment providers, if we think about it that way, but just in general. So that's, as you can tell, if you're like, but Bader, I know, I'm like, I know, but this one in particular really kind of hit me um, that it really is weakening our interpersonal relationships and all of the skills that we're trying to do in treatment, right? Is that, that we're trying to really improve our ability to adaptively cope with any types of feelings that come on board is that cannabis is not helping with us because y'all in treatment, this is what I'm hearing. We have about 38% of the women in our treatment center right now that have cannabis as part of their um, substance use profile. And they're like, ah, oh, it's no big deal. It's just weed. Um, but it's really getting in the way of them getting well and them healing. That's just my caveat.
I want to do one more thing um, just to kind of throw a little bit in there for the actual biological nature of substances. So sometimes if you put substances together, they are additive, right? One plus one is two. Um, those are not usually the substances that we have to worry about too much, but the ones that are synergistic, it's one plus one is 11. Um, I do have to tell you that alcohol and cannabis together have that effect. And so if you've ever heard anybody kind of talk about being crossed or faded um, or cross faded in the academic literature, we'd call it the simultaneous use of alcohol and marijuana. But y'all, this is when we are high, right? It helps with nausea. We do that, but y'all, when we get drunk, when we drink too much, our body's ability for us to not shut down, right? For us not to kill myself is that I would throw up the alcohol as my brain would register that I've drank too much and I need to get rid of it. But if I am high and drunk, I cannot do either. And so now this effect will last for about six to eight hours. And I have many, 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 especially young people, right? Raise their hand and say that they've babysat somebody that's been crossed, but it is a very uncomfortable situation. Hallucinations, disoriented, memory loss. It would be kind of the equivalent of a blackout, if you will, but, but kind of still alert for it. And so it's one of the things just to ask about if people are using both of them simultaneously. I'm going to take a pause because this is one of the gender differences. When we have and start with substances, women often start lower, um, but we ramp up our use faster than men. So we have the same disease, if you will, but it's at different rates. So we'll start with lower levels, but we escalate. We can also build a tolerance a little bit faster because of body composition, but we incur a stronger impact of the substance. It's usually a two to one ratio. And that is because cannabis is a fat soluble drug. Nicotine and tobacco are water soluble drugs. That's why they're actually more predictable, especially in different bodies um, with different uh, fat and water volumes. Um, but it's why we can kind of do that. Like if I drink one drink, I really, and I, if I know my gender and my weight, I pretty much know when I've metabolized it out. But because of cannabis being a fat soluble drug, it's harder on the female body. It's actually about twice as hard. Same goes with withdrawal um, for that. So you see that. So if we were using cannabis, right? And one of the things we have to know is that we've added cannabis withdrawal to our DSM. That is because of high potency. So y'all in the days of views times, right? And the Woodstock weed, we weren't really even talking about withdrawal because it wasn't as significant. But in this current time that we have now, withdrawal is actually part of our diagnostic manuals. It's part of our medical knowledge is that the withdrawal is so intense um, is that it, it's its own medical concern. So if we, if we stop smoking or using cannabis in any way, the withdrawal is going to peak at day four. It's going to last for about 16. And we're actually going to have a resurgence of a lot of those cravings and urges um, and markedly ill feelings, that restless, irritable, and discontent. It's actually going to surge right at the end. Unfortunately, for some of us, right as we're walking out of the treatment center um, for that. But again, the difference in the gender difference, please, please know that the withdrawal is actually going to be harder for women because of body composition, right? And because of this fat soluble nature, and we are more susceptible to cravings and relapse, return to use, right? That's usually why we return to use anyway, is that we don't like the withdrawal symptoms and so we know how to stop them. Um, so this is to me a time where we can offer a lot of treatment and support for individuals. We're going to do our last kind of caveat for pregnancy and parenting. So we now know, we knew that before, but I love when the Surgeon General will come out and to kind of let us know that no amount of marijuana, no amount of cannabis is safe um, during pregnancy. And I'll bring your eyes again to our number one sold out costume, our Halloween costume um, here in Colorado. Um, 20, I think it was 2017, that one sold out. Um, there were parent versions of it as well. But to be the world's dopest mom, right? That's that parent company. Think about the hearts and the minds campaign that's come out and this for-profit kind of industry that's letting us know that this substance is great for us, especially as parents. So we know that cannabis is one of the highly, one of the most used substances during pregnancy. And we know that we're getting a lot of recommendations um, from our bud tenders, right? And even our healthcare providers and people will stop me on that one and ask what's going on. My first guess is a lack of knowledge. Um, because currently right now, potentially our healthcare providers 
are not as well educated as you all, as you're learning today, um, the significant impacts that are happening. And that a lot of, um, to me, when we talk about some of the pregnancy stats, a lot of these things have, um, but sometimes the truth is very quiet and then a, a paid message can be very loud. And so the paid message, especially from the industry, um, was that cannabis was safe, it was gonna be fine, um, and we were gonna be able to use throughout our lifetimes, but that's not necessarily the case. So we got a lot of recommendations, um, especially a member from the dispensaries and a lot of bud tenders were telling us that it was okay to treat nausea, but again, it was based much on personal opinion and not science. So the science follows. It is the most common illicit drug use. Um, we have it anywhere from like three to 30%. So if you think about the women, that are walking around, about a third of them might actually use cannabis during their pregnancy. But this is the caveat that I teach all women. Cannabis freely crosses the placenta. There is no protection from my use to the fetus, none whatsoever. And I say it that way is that I, that would, that's my soundbite. And I will probably, I will definitely die on that hill if somebody asks me, um, because I think that's what we tried to understand, right? Is that what I was doing? Oh, is that I might be able to process the drug a little bit and that wouldn't be as impactful um, to the developing child, but that is not the case because it is so impactful. It's going to disrupt my endocannabinoid system, and it's actually going to disrupt the development of the fetus's endocannabinoid system. And y'all, we can see that happen within five weeks, right? Within even the fifth week of pregnancy, that endocannabinoid system is developing and the use of cannabis can severely impact that. We're going to get fetal growth restrictions. We're going to get still births preterm, same, especially if we're smoking, we're going to get a lot of the same results that we used to see with tobacco and nicotine. Um, we're going to get a lot of neonatal withdrawal um, and the impact in pregnancy is very significant. We're going to get some infant toxicity. This is also a development. So as the child is in utero, right, we have that exposure to it. Um, but when they then are developing, and even the industry is agreeing with us, because that's where I got this study. So the ABCD um, study that came through is really letting us know that we're going to have problems with neurological development as children age. There's going to be hyperactivity, poor cognitive functioning, um, a lot of changes. We're going to see very significant, you know, the numbers for autism are starting um, to skyrocket and they are learning that is direct in direct correlation to cannabis use. We're gonna see ADHD um, numbers go up as well. But I say it to you this way. So think about pregnancy, right? Is that if I used a substance during pregnancy and then maybe like middle childhood. And so let's grab, I don't know, first grade or second grade is that's when we're actually gonna see the most um, significant kind of developmental impact. It won't be right outside of the womb. We're gonna get some infant toxicity when we talk about it that way. Um, but really the developmental impacts that we're going to see are gonna be in middle childhood. And they are going to include psychotic-like experiences, depression, anxiety, impulsivity. You know, we're making it tough on our teachers. We're making us, we're making it tough on ourselves as parents um, to really think about that there is no impact for cannabis use um, in pregnancy. So there's huge significant impacts um, during the pregnancy as well as after. And so we think about this, um, it's shown to be associated with that early onset. We talk about kind of mood disorders, but I want to bring you mostly then to breastfeeding. So think about pregnancy, right? So it's a critical period that we would really understand that there is no safe use um, of cannabis during pregnancy, but we had some questions then about breastfeeding. So I do want to let you know that THC can be found in breast milk. And it can be found as little as one hour. So if I smoke or use, right, I inject it as a tincture, an edible, um, it can be found in breast milk in as little as one hour and can last actually up to six weeks. Um, I thought when the very first time I did the study, um, I reported a study, it was six days. And I actually had the author of one of the studies that found that it can be up to six weeks. So if you don't know a concept of pump and dump, right, where we might use a substance or we might drink, right, and we could pump some of that breast milk out, and then it would not be in the next feeding, that cannot happen when it comes to cannabis. It sticks around, again, in that fat-soluble nature. And we're starting to see um, very significant impacts um, in the amount of concentrates that come into breast milk. They are starting to see it could be even of an eightfold, like eight times as much, so that the the 
breast milk might actually have a higher concentrate of THC than I use. And again, it's because of that fat soluble nature of this drug and it accumulates um, as well in the body. So we're going to start to see that, especially we know that parenting is stressful and we start to be able to understand that if we made it through pregnancy, right. And maybe we didn't use, especially after pregnancy and, and postpartum, we really need to support women to understand that that might be a time that they return to use thinking that that critical window um, is over, but it is not. So screen, educate, treat, even just, if you think about this, there was a uh, 64%, I don't think it's on this one, but if women were educated, is that 64% of the women during pregnancy, if they were educated about substance, that they stayed sober throughout their pregnancy and beyond. And we think about that, y'all, if, if I'm using substances and I actually found out that I'm pregnant, it takes me sometimes up to even four months to try to get sober and to maintain sobriety during pregnancy. Um, but it really is providing support, counsel, education, screeners, treatment, anything that we can for women to do that. And there's a lot of great people that are doing it. So the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, um, there's a lot of campaigns, right? We're putting some pamphlets out um, for women. We're putting some PSA, some public service announcements to let them know that there could be effects on our bodies as women, as well as um, uh, the developing fetus. So I really hope that you have these resources around you. If not, these are in multiple languages that they're offered by the ACOG. Um, so you can grab them on their websites um, and just have any, any kind of information out there because education is so powerful. Tough as a mutter campaigns, all the things. So look, these are the interventions and we're going to wrap. Listen, just to have a conversation. Start with that. Offer facts, not fear, but please let women know, especially as women, families, parenting, anybody to know the impacts of cannabis use and when and how it's going to be the most impactful. Because even if the impact is subtle for a woman and her body, it is significant. And I say it that way often, just because some of these effects are subtle, they are significant. They are disrupting us at the very base of our bodies. This endocannabinoid system that you saw is literally from head to toe. So there's not a part of our body that isn't affected by this drug um, whenever we use. And so it's really getting in the way of a lot of basics that we need for parenting and life and living. So educate, educate. We have screeners. Um, even just getting a person to like track their own personal stats. We have marijuana is anonymous. We have mutual aid groups. Uh, we have treatment, counseling, peer support. And if you can't get anybody to do anything, then just challenge them to what we call in the field. It's like a tea break, a tolerance break. And it really is. They're free. Thanks, Tom Fontana. He's the University of Vermont. You can go on there, you can print them off and they're just little journals and booklets and they last for a period of 45 days and they can kind of mark their progress. And y'all, he's a scientist at heart. So he knows that withdrawal period and really even speaks about how anxiety might peak on day four, right? But he walks people through um, a lot of the concerns that they might have during the withdrawal period. But that's what we can know as treatment providers. It's what we can know as just peer support. This is a tough drug um, to get out of our body as well. What we're doing for addiction rates too, I want to think about that is the addiction rates that we had prior were about one in 10. And that kind of was the equivalent to alcohol. Um, but right now y'all, our cannabis addiction rates are moving to the 30% addiction rate. So that's three out of 10 people is when in fact they use, they're using in a disordered fashion and they would qualify for a cannabis use disorder. Those numbers are shifting way more more to the numbers that we have that are like nicotine, right? Um, and cocaine. So the very addictive kind of drugs. So this is the cannabis conversation. If you want to know how to have one, this is it. Do you consume? Do you interact with any form of cannabis? What does it help you do? And that is to me, one of your first lines of interventions. Tell me what this drug is helping you do. Um, and we can probably find a skill, right? Some kind of support or even some potentially some medication assisted therapies or we could actually treat the thing that it's helping with. If it's helping with anxiety or depression is that we actually might then treat the mental health concern instead of just putting kind of this bandaid on it. Is anything get close to the effects of cannabis? What are you using? So know your strains, know your potencies. And if it keeps you from getting what you want or starting to cause a problem, would you be willing to put it down? That's just one of the most simple ways that I can, um, 
kind of engage any type of a, a person that uses substances in a, just an intelligent conversation. Again, we're having conversations, not confrontations. So these are just the women must knows. We are just likely to develop use as men, um, but we do so, remember, in that telescoping effect. So when we step up to substance use, we actually do so in that more in a, in a, a stronger trajectory. We will actually often develop a substance use disorder potentially faster um, than men. Although we get to treatment about six years later than men. I'll let you do the um, paradox on that one. Cannabis use um, in and of itself, as well as withdrawal, is harder on women's bodies, Potency is a significant concern. You saw all of the products and how they get positioned in our lives from the morning to night. Uh, we're trying to catch up. Research and science are trying to catch up, especially with women's research and science. Um, we are very influenced by our relationships. And we think about that, though, this substance is not helping us engage well with those relationships. We have different brain changes. Cannabis is not recommended. And y'all, I really will say that. That's a soundbite. A lot of know, I know many people that disagree with me, but cannabis is not recommended during any period of time during pregnancy or breastfeeding in any amount. It is not safe. Um, it's not a safe substance when we use. And our consequences, especially as women, are much more significant um, as we talk about that during pregnancy, right? Or even during child development. So if you have your phone or you're not on your phone, um, go ahead and grab this QR code and give me as much direct feedback as you would love. The gentleman um, and, at NMI kind of gather it for me to say, hey, less of, more of, um, don't say that, whatever you would like, um, so we can get some conversation going because I think, oh, we might be short on the Q&A time. Letitia, I always learn things from you. I, I so appreciate you. Got a couple quick questions that did come in. Um, one question was that if, if there's such a deleterious effect of THC, why is it the word was used prescribe? We can't prescribe THC, but we can recommend it. Why is it recommended for PTSD? You're going to see me, but I have to be honest, as I treat PTSD on a daily basis, I don't know why they're recommending it. A lot of this is what I say, y'all. Drugs work. Right. So if I wanted to numb, that's why a lot of us mm -hmm. use substances ourselves is that if I was struggling with critical self-talk and I was struggling with activation, especially with PTSD to know that word, the difference of anxiety versus activation, you know, I know how to shut my body and my brain off. Um, then drugs often work faster than medications or skills. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why I think for us as a nation, we don't often like feeling the feels. Um, and to do trauma work, it really is, um, it is difficult. And it's one of the things is that we will often avoid doing the work because it is quite agitating as it's healing. Um, but yeah. Got it. Okay. Another I question that did come in. a good answer for that. And I would really like to shoot the gap and get in the way of that, especially for our veterans. And y'all, I have some caveats when we turn a product, right? And that was, oh, I'm going to get on my tangent. When the industry stops selling a product, then they just turn it pink. And then when that product stops selling, they just repackage it and they'll put a rainbow on it. Yeah. And all, when those stop selling, they put a flag on it. And that is to me where we were at is that they stopped that marketing that stopped for women and the LGBT population and the BIPOC population. They put a flag on it. And I have so many things to say off camera um, that I don't, that's mine. Okay. Another question came in just at the minute or so we got left here in your practice. What do you see the greatest problem withdrawal from THC or alcohol? If we're just talking withdrawal, um, yes. withdrawal from THC is harder on our women, especially on our women. Um, and we struggle with that, getting people through that period of withdrawal, especially that 16 week. Cause we start talking about sleep. We start talking about mood disruption and because we don't have the same medication assisted therapies that we do, it really is a place that's like hydration and sleep and support and, and really understanding that this is a chemical process that my body just sort of has to suffer through, but like gratitude to COVID, at least we sort of can conceptualize being sick, if you will, for a couple of weeks and we don't give up that easily. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, harder to me, hard. and because we have medication assisted, we have ways to help with alcohol withdrawal, right? That kind of lessen the impact. 
and we're still um, learning some of the things that would help with cannabis withdrawal. Okay. And before we wrap up, there's a couple of you out there. I sent you a direct message. If you check chat, if you logged in with just a single name or a series of initials, I'm going to need a name to go with that one too. So check your uh, chat function before you sign off. Ed, you got anything, sir? No, I, as, as usual, Letitia, outstanding presentation. Like Dale, I learn something every time I listen to you. It's amazing. And uh, we do have several people asking uh, for your slide deck. If if you're so inclined in a PDF version, okay. uh, send it to Dale or myself, and we'll be glad to forward it to our host uh, in a PDF version, please. And we'll make that available along with the recording. This, this session was recorded and will be provided not only on our website, but to the host. And uh, again, please share the slide deck. Several people chimed in. Thank you. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Bader, for an amazing presentation. Uh, you never cease to to amaze us as as uh, you're, you're our all-star at NMI. So well, we appreciate you very much. You know, we're just trying, to, just trying to get the truth out there. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All, All right, right, folks, have a great day. Enjoy your week. Just do it one step at a time, guys. That's all we can do. God bless you for what you do. Thank you. All. Just want to dance here.